Good evening, everybody. Hello, I'm Susan. I'm a music publisher at 23rd Precinct Music, a publishing company based in Glasgow. We are partners with Notting Hill Music, who have offices in London and Los Angeles. And today, or tonight rather, I'm going to talk you through a short presentation on music publishing, the basics, where I'll take you through the beginner's steps to understanding what music publishing is, hopefully. Um, I'll also speak a bit about the work that I do on a daily basis at 23rd Precinct Music. Um, so yeah, currently I'm, to, I'm a music publisher at 23rd. I'm also a &R for Notting Hill Music's uh, Southeast Asia territory. So I handle all the pitches to Korea and Japan and such like. And I also run a deep house record label called Deltos Records in my free time. Um, yeah, and that's a bit about me. So today I'm going to give you a rundown on the content shown here. If you've got any questions or comments, please put them in the live chat box and I'll be responding on the chat box um, and I'll do my best to answer as many as possible. So I'm going to cover what is music publishing, copyright and collection societies, understanding your royalty revenue, what does it mean to be a songwriter, what we do as a music publisher, writing songs for other artists, music synchronisation and some challenges and current challenges um, in music publishing. So what is music publishing? The word publishing can sometimes carry some confusion, I think. Um, its origins date back to when composers and songwriters used sheet music to document their compositions. Music publishers played a role um, in the management of the intellectual property, i.e. the copyright held within the sheet music. Um, nowadays, we recognise publishers far less in this print publishing world, perhaps, as the music industry has developed and moved away from physical documentation of works and now most things are done digitally. Um, however, the pivotal role of a publisher remains the same, so managing and protecting the exploitation of intellectual property, i.e. the copyright, with regards to songwriting and composing. So the takeaway thing from this slide here really is that music publishing is about the managing, uh, is about managing the exploitation of intellectual property and it's specific to songwriters and composers. Um, so yeah, just another wee bit on this. So I found this really great concise description of what is music publishing, which I pulled from Song Trust's website. So Song Trust are a music publishing administrator who I'll talk about a bit later on. But their description was music publishing that refers to the money you can make from royalties which are paid to you when other people or organisations or companies use music that you wrote or co-wrote. Copyright law protects songwriters by giving them exclusive rights to grant or deny the reproduction distribution or performance of their original songs. So what are these rights? Um, they can be broken down into three key sort of segments. So you get performance, mechanical and micro sync. So delving a bit deeper into those three areas. So performance royalties or public performance royalties as they're sometimes known. It's when your works, your songs, your compositions are played on the radio or in a public setting or in a, a concert or in a bar, a restaurant, a nightclub, anything like that. Um, mechanical royalties refer to, it used to be when you could mechanically press perhaps a vinyl or a CD or a cassette, and that still applies today, but it applies to the digital reproduction as well. So things like downloads, things like streams, um, as well as the physical um, sort of mechanical replications of your works. And finally, micro syncs. So micro syncs are licenses that are used for audio visual works. Um, and it's normally for many uses as opposed to just one license. So things like um, YouTube and uh, YouTube in, uh, embeds or other video streaming sites um, is typically user generated content as well. And more so is typically generate minute uh, amounts of inco income, but it's still quite important to recognize, I think so. Those are the three key, key areas. Um, so I've just kind of touched on what is music publishing and, and, and copyright and collection societies kind of go hand in hand with music publishing because it's all about intellectual property. It's all about copyright. So hopefully if you're based in the UK, you might have seen or you know about PRS for Music, but if you don't, PRS for Music UK is a collection society for songwriters and composers and there's another title for PRS and MCPS combined so um, within PRS for Music um, a CMO, a collection management organisation as it's known, um, it has two sort of subcategories so PRS, Performing Rights Society and MCPS, Mechanical Copyright Protection Society. 
So PRS for Music is a membership organisation and it's governed by its members. So I think currently they have around about 150,000 members, which includes songwriters and composers and producers. It work, uh, they work very closely with other collection societies or PROs, so performing rights organisations. If you ever hear the word PRO, that's what that means. Um, so they work with other PROs across the world. So there's different PROs in different territories. So you get ASCAP in America, you get IMRO in Ireland, GEMA in Germany, Germany sorry, and, and so on. So they all communicate and coordinate. So if you join PRS for Music, they'll collect royalties for on your behalf worldwide. You don't have to join every single collection society in every different territory. Um, would highly recommend if you're not familiar with PRS and, and what they do, then you visit the PRS for Music website. So there's a really great little video actually they show um, which sort of breaks down in a little cool little animation. Just if you're struggling to get your head around this, just go back and visit this. Um, but yeah, just delving deeper into the copyright and collection societies. So there's two rights within a recorded song. So um, I'm going to take these sort of bit by bit, but within a recorded piece of music, there's a master rights and the publishing rights. So the publishing rights, that refers to the music and the lyrics. So this can be broken down into two key areas, performance and mechanical, as I've previously mentioned. And to emphasise, the performance royalties would be generated from things like public performance, a live gig, if your song's put in the radio or in a bar in a nightclub or so on. And to, re to reiterate, mechanical royalties for publishing are generated when your works or your songs are reproduced onto vinyl or cassette or they're made available to download or, or stream. Um, you do generate streaming royalties from performance and mechanical, but we'll discuss a bit more about that later. Um, so the writer's share and the publisher's share, what does that mean? So these different segments here, the performance royalties and the mechanical royalties are broken down in writer's share and publisher's share. So what does this mean? As a member of PRS, you're entitled to up to 50% of your PRS di royalties direct to you, even if you do have a publisher. So 50% of your PRS royalties go direct to you and 50% go to your publisher if you do have a publisher, after which they take their contractual rate so if you're still with me, um, publishers collect 100% of MCPS as well. So after deducting their mechanical royalty, whatever that's in your contract with the publisher, they will then distribute the remainder to the songwriters. It is possible to manage these two income streams on your own. However, it's becoming increasingly difficult with the nature, that, the nature of the music industry and the way, the way in which music is consumed across the world. It's so incredibly complex. So it's really worth looking into getting a publisher so who can collect more, if not all, your, all the royalties you're due. Um, and you can look for a, a publishing administrator or you could look for someone like ourselves to do more on the creative side as well as doing the administrative side. Um, so that's the publishing rights. <laughs> Uh, the master rights refer to this, the audio recording, so it's sometimes referred to as sound recording copyright. So within that, if any of you are artists uh, in your own right and you're releasing your own music or you're in a band and you're releasing your own music, you may be familiar with um, a distribution uh, distributors like CD Baby or Digital Kid or Emu Bands or Ingrooves or whoever it is you use. So they are responsible for delivering your product, your sound recording, to digital streaming platforms and stores like iTunes and Spotify and Deezer. And you'll see uh, royalty income, so streaming income, digital revenue streams through your distributor. There's also another side to the master rights, um, sort of coin, and that's PPL income, neighbouring rights income. And that's when your sound recording is played in the, in, on the radio or in shops or in bars or in restaurants, you'll be due a mechanical neighbouring rights royalty from that so um, there's if you're a record label then I'd highly suggest that you sign up to PPL if you're a performer or a musician I'd highly uh, highly recommend you you sign up to PPL it's free to join um, and just to emphasize that's on the sound recording side so if you're playing a, mus a musical instrument or you're singing or you produce the track and you play synthesizers or something like that then you can collect royalties um, on the master side if your songs are getting played on the radio. So hopefully I haven't melted your brain too much with that bit. Um, so just another, just a final bit on the um, copyright and collection societies is when you write new music, this is you creating new intellectual property and this is, uh, and you have the rights to manage the usage of it, the intellectual property. Think of it as 
the copyright within the song, the composition, the music, the lyrics, this is the publishing copyright. As I've previously mentioned, obviously you do get the master copyright, but for now let's focus on publishing rights. So you've written a song, what's next? It's important to document um, and protect this new copyright. So when you've written your new song or you're perhaps you're preparing it for it to be released, you should log this new information with your collection society. So that would be PRS for music here in the UK. They'll ask for details like track title, details of writers, um, their percentage. So if you write a song with three other people, um, are you splitting it 25% each or are you doing unequal splits? Obviously it all has to add up to 100%. So as long as it adds up to 100%, you should be good to go. Um, so you might be asking yourself, like, should I join PRS, should I join MCPS, should I join both? So um, put this little graphic here. So if you meet the criteria in any of these boxes, then you should join the um, affiliated collection society. So if, you're, if your works or your songs are getting played on the radio or they're getting played on TV or they're getting perform uh, performed in a live setting, if you're performing your own songs in a live setting, um, then you should join PRS for music. Um, Similarly, um, if your music recording is being reproduced um, or is available to purchase or it's available to stream or download, um, then you should join MCPS. If you have a publisher, they will join you to MCPS, or MCPS directly, so there's no need to join if you have a publishing deal. Um, and if you're not involved in the songwriting process, then you don't need to join any, if that's an obvious thing to say, but just to emphasise, both of these organisations exist to ensure that songwriters and composers and music publishers as well are fairly paid for their work. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. Uh, just a couple of bits on understanding your royalty revenue before we move, a couple of more bits on PRS and MCPS before we move on to something else. But um, you can join these two organisations independently and individually as an uh, as as an art, as a songwriter. Um, and just to emphasise again, um, you can join PRS if your music's getting played on the radio or it's getting played at live gigs or whatever else. They'll distribute royalties to you direct four times a year. And um, even if you do have a publisher, like I mentioned in the last slide, fifty percent would still go directly to you. Um, like I mentioned, four times a year. So April, July, October and December, and that'll get paid straight into your bank account. Um, if you do have a publisher, the other 50% goes to the publisher and they'll take their contractual rate. And normally most publishers pay out twice a year. So you might find yourself sort of overlapping with statements and things like that. Um, with, P uh, with MCPS, you can expect to see payments every month. Um, and um, just to emphasize again, this is an extremely complex side of the business. So I would highly recommend maybe assigning someone like uh, TuneCore or SongTrust or Centric who can collect your mechanical royalties on your behalf. Um, if you're just looking for someone to sort of tidy up the admin for you. Um, but yeah, NCPS, when your music's played, uh, replicated on the CD, vinyls, cassettes, or is available to stream or download. Um, this is just a quick screenshot of the PRS for Music login homepage. Um, if you join PRS or MCPS, you'll be able to manage, document, amend, search your works all through this portal here. So this is where you'll see your publishing statements too. So you can check and see if things have been paid correctly or if you've, I don't know, if you played a big festival in the summer, you can log, log on and register your live performance there. Um, you can register all the works that you played, or if you've got a residency in a bar or a restaurant, um, and, and then there are PRS PPL licensed venue, you can register all your works that you're performing in that in that set. Um, because remember, your due royalties if your uh, works are getting broadcast um, in a public setting. So, um, just another thing on that, sorry, quickly. So you can see that you can also raise queries with PRS. They've got a dedicated team who are there, um, you know, what feels like 24 hours a day to um, check any queries or uh, check any unpaid royalties or manage any, um, any problems. Um, just a wee bit on frequently asked questions, which when it comes to copyright and collection societies and just generally PRS, 
Um, when should I join PRS or MCPS? I did mention this before, but you should join PRS if your music's broadcast on TV, online, radio, or is performed live. You should join MCPS if your music's been released by a record company, downloaded, or is available on CD or vinyl or whatever else. Um, how much will a songwriter earn for one million streams on Spotify? That is a question we get a lot, um, and there is no one uh, definitive answer. Um, to this it really does vary so much that it's hard to even give like a ball ballpark figure um so things like if users use a freemium model or uh even can depend on the territory so the the the, the actual incomes vary so much from platform to platform so spotify and deezer and youtube music and uh soundcloud and all these platforms play out different royalty rates so my best advice here is really for you to manage that expectations when you are seeing your income through uh, your publishing statements, through your MCPS and PRS statements. Um, that sound like I tried to avoid that question, but there really is um, just such a wide range of income streams for that, for different DSPs. Can I claim the publisher's share on mechanical royalties without a publisher? So yes, you can, as I mentioned before, but it's incredibly hard, if not impossible, to claim all the royalties you're due without a state-of-the-art system in place. And this is why I would, I would recommend reaching out to a publisher or a publisher administrator where they can help and um, manage this responsibility. Um, yeah. Can I release a cover of someone else's song? Yes, you can release a cover on someone else's song. Covering a song means that you're co copying someone else's intellectual property and there's nothing wrong with that, so long as you're not trying to claim the song as your own. So this is where the two copyrights that we were speaking about earlier come into place. So the recorded piece is something you're, re you're creating a new recorded piece, but you are copying the publishing rights. So you would have to credit your new recorded piece with the original songwriters of uh, the original track. Um, so you can release it on Spotify and you can release it through DSPs. You just have to dis you just have to um, uh, observe that it's a, a cover and you won't be claiming publishing royalties for that. You will retain the master rights as if you're creating a new recording though, so that, that would be yours. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. Um, I want to sample a piece of music, where do I start? So sampling is something that's really, really prevalent. Um, and all, all genres of music, typically uh, sort of historically hip hop music and, and dance music sort of was particularly sample, sample heavy, but if um, any producers or any people out there who are looking to sample a piece of music, find out who the copyright, original copyright owners are and reach out to them. Um, I mean, there's nothing worse than you putting a bit of music out online, which one you don't have the rights to, um, and then you're facing some lawsuit for misuse of someone else's intellectual property. Um, it's a bit like that car advert you used to get in the cinemas. Um, you know, you wouldn't steal someone else's car. You wouldn't steal. Uh, you don't. You wouldn't steal something from a shop. So you shouldn't be doing it with music either. Um, if you're really struggling for 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 things like um, for samples and, and sort of um, inspiration, there is sample libraries which are royalty free. So those are fine to use. So things like Splice, um, you can use sample to your heart content your heart's content off things like that but but ripping things from youtube videos and things like that then that is in breach of uh, copyright law just a point in that as well if you are sampling something and um, something that we do sometimes is we get people to re-record the sample so say there was a vocal sample that we wanted to use or one of our writers wanted to use in a track we could get someone else to re-record the vocal because that's creating a new master copyright so we just have to clear the publishing copyright so that's just something to think about for anybody out there who's struggling with samples. Um, and the last point is I'm still hella confused. Where can I find more resources on music publishing? Um, I understand and I totally uh, get that this is hugely complex and I'm not expecting everybody to understand everything I'm saying, but there are great resources out, out there and um, lots of great webinars, lots of great um, text resources. So you should check out platforms like the British Phonographic Industry, AIM, which is the Association of Independent Music, the Music Publishers Association, which have got lots of great resources. Song Trust have got lots of good reading documents online as well. And um, yeah, just our own platform as well. We've got a couple of, um, I think Resonate, I've got a couple of um, publishing videos which you can check out in your free time.
so yeah moving on to a bit more of the lighter stuff um what does it mean to be a songwriter um so a songwriter by definition is someone who composes words or music or both for songs um you know you can be more than one thing and this slide was really just to demonstrate some of our publishing roster at 23rd precinct music who do um a multitude of things shall we say so starting from left to right we've got emma brammer who is first and foremost a songwriter she's an artist in her own right she records and releases her own music. She's a session singer um, and she's done stuff like Jules Holland and she's toured with Gaz Coombs and lots of other cool people. Um, and she's also just recently taken up um, production. So she's always trying to level up her skill set, which is, is, which is phenomenal. Um, next to her, we've got Scott Forshaw, who again is a songwriter, producer. He's an artist in his own right as well. He's got a couple of aliases that he works under. Um, and he's also a mixing engineer and a mastering engineer um, and he's based over in Dubai so he does a lot of um, production work for people and um, he's also a DJ so you can see he's a, a busy busy man. Um, Alex Robson in the middle there so um, she's also a songwriter and an artist and she's also a studio owner. She, she runs chart house studios in Portsmouth where she has a long list of clients that she works with and um, she's always up for collaborating she's great to work with and um, she's also a producer she can produce really really well to a great standard um, and yeah she's she's great um, next to her we've got David Forbes who's probably one of the most well-known trans DJs in the world definitely in Scotland um, and he's a songwriter producer artist he runs his own label he runs his own studio um, he's a mentor for a lot of young um, producers out there as well. So you can see that he's sort of jack of all trades as David. Um, and finally, Joy Farouk on the far right. So she's um, a, a most recent sign in to 23rd Precinct Music and she's a really interesting person who's had a really illustrious career so far. Um, she was a session singer and she's a touring musician with like Moby and she was in a band called Incognito in the 90s, a really popular dance band. And she's a songwriter and an artist in her own right as well. Um, and she has a, a, a producer that she works with um, all the time who is called Justin Keelty. So you can see that she's sort of found a producer that she likes to work with and they just work together all the time, which is a cool, a cool thing. Um, yeah, so just a bit more on that and, and being a songwriter in 2021 and what that is. Um, and uh, if you're interested in writing songs for other people or just developing your songwriting career, I guess, um, just jotted down some tips and some advice that I, I prefer to see when people are approaching me personally. Um, really, if you're a songwriter, you, you really need to build up your repertoire of music. I know that sounds obvious to say, but if you've just written one or two songs, then you really need to get out there and just build up your repertoire and make it as strong and diverse as possible. If you want it to be diverse, maybe you want to keep it, you know, um, sort of tunnel vision to one genre, but you get lots of people who want to write um, to different different genres. Um, showcase your skill set. I mean, that sounds obvious, but when people are approaching us or approach me or I get sent links, I want people to demonstrate that they're an amazing vocalist or an amazing lyricist, or maybe they've got great production skills or um, you know, whatever whatever that is, whatever their strong suit is. Um, spend time perfecting your craft. Again, sounds obvious to say, but, um, you know, if you're just doing this maybe an hour a week or whatever else, whatever, I think you really need to make that hour count um, and you have to be always looking to develop and move up to the next level and, um, you know, maybe getting a new bit of equipment or it might be downloading a new bit of software or it might be going and learning about, music rights and, and publishing rights or it might be um just anything you always have to be honing in on perfecting your craft um, demonstrate diversity if you're looking to write across genres so this is a bit more specific so if you're approaching someone like a publisher or like ourselves um then i would advise that you and you're interested in writing for other people sorry that i would advise that you showcase in your playlist or your pitch to us your diversity in songwriting. So if you can write a hip hop or trap, or you can write pop or R&B, or you can write folk, then demonstrate that in, you, in your outreach to someone. I think um, if you can answer as many questions as possible before I need to reply. So just try and get that all out in your first, uh, your first email or your first outreach. Throw yourself into collaborations. Um, if you're going to be a songwriter or a producer, you're going to have to get used to collaborating with other people. I mean, it's really the most, um, 
one of the most collaborative industries I would say within the music industry itself you find yourself writing with people you've never met writing songs that don't exist and places you've probably never been before um so it's a quite a quite an unusual sector to be working with but you have to be up for collaborating and if you can demonstrate that you're you've already done that on your own when you're reaching out to a publisher then that's kudos to you get brownie points from me um pick your best works again seems so obvious but don't send an idea that you've had at 3am 3, 3 that morning just being like yeah I just wrote this and if it's not up to the standard of the rest of your music then don't send it um, seek out feedback from friends, peers, industry professionals. Um, you know, as long as it's constructive criticism, I think there's a lot to be taken from, um, especially peer-to-peer -peer feedback, like sending it to your other songwriting friends or sending it to maybe someone you were in a band with or you're in a band with, just asking them for their feedback. And, you know, honesty is the best policy um, as long as it's constructive, you know. And know your rights. You know, hopefully I've touched on this at the beginning. You've got a bit more of an understanding about what publishing rights are and what you are the owner of what you have, what it is you represent exactly. So um, I think if you can have a basic understanding of that, that will set you in good stead. So yeah, ask yourself, why are you writing songs? Why, who are you writing them for? What's the, end, what's the end goal here? So once you know the answer to these questions, you'll have a fuller idea of where you want to go as a writer. And I think subsequently you'll have a fuller idea of what sort of publishing company could assist you in getting to that end goal. Um, you know. I think I've got on the next slide. Yeah, so um, find your starting point, um, know what it is you're trying to achieve in the end. Once you take note of that, you'll be able to piece together a pathway to reach that end goal. So if you're an artist, if you're a songwriter and you're also an artist and you're, you're only interested in writing your own songs, which is totally, totally fine. Maybe something like a publishing administ uh, administrative deal could work best for you initially. Um, if you're not looking to team up with other producers or collaborate with other people or get your music pitched for sync then that might be the thing for you whereas we at 23rd Precinct Music we're very active on the creative side of things so we sort of invest in um, songwriters careers um, and producers careers and we team them up with other producers team them up with vocalists other songwriters and um, you know perhaps you're a lyricist and you've maybe only got limited um, sort of musical skill or instrument skill and we can hook you up with someone who's you know a pianist or a guitarist or whatever that may be. Um, if you're looking to compose tracks um, specific to certain briefs, so maybe you're looking to write tracks for other people, that's something that we could help a lot more with. Um, and oh, if you're interested in creating bespoke compositions for TV, film, soundtracks, all that sort of thing, that's something more a creative publisher would do as opposed to an administrative publisher. Um, so I hope that makes sense. And yeah, just to emphasise again, so at 23rd Precinct Music, we're not a publishing administ administrator. We do provide the same services as a publishing administrator. So we register the tracks with collection societies, we monetize your copyright, we provide statements, but we're also very active on the creative side in addition to that. So we pitch for sync, we set up co-writing sessions, we've set up songwriting camps in the past, which are fun. Um, they sort of involve getting a whole bunch of writers together from different areas of, of the UK. I think we did one in Glasgow, one in Dublin a few years ago. Um, and we get a group of writers together, separate them into groups of three, provide them with some briefs to write to. Um, and then off the back of that, I'll pitch those tracks to labels or maybe the client that's in the brief in, in the first place. Um, I also um, pitch a lot of demos to management companies and record labels and so on. So um that's just something worth thinking about if you're looking to pitch your music which you're not going to release as, a, as an artist and you're just looking to pitch it to other labels that's something that someone like us could help with um and yeah we can assist with collaborative projects and um, co-writing sessions like i mentioned and so on um so yeah the pitching process like i mentioned in that slide there so as a creatively active publisher we pitch demos tracks acapellas top lines all sorts of um you know creative uh, sort of songs or part songs or just um little ideas snippets so um this is something that we can really help with um and push from from our side um, so hopefully you'll recognize some of these labels that we've worked with in the past so um, Parlophone, obviously Polydor, Sony, Majors, 
um, major players in the in the recording game. Yeah, so the pitching process, just to to to, to emphasise, so we receive a variety of briefs from different parties. Um, so I can be pitching to those guys that send us briefs, or I can be reaching out to new people. So I'm always looking to expand our um sort of network or label contacts, management companies that we look to pitch to other publishers, you know, setting up co-writing sessions with other publishers. Um, so that's how that works. Um, briefs, briefs come in many shapes and sizes and forms, so they can be in search of full songs, acapellas, instrumentals, top lines. Um, and this is when a client, like a, a management company or, or a, a publisher or a label will send us stuff that they're looking for essentially. Um, and we work with, with those guys who are based in lots of different territories and they bring a, a unique collaborative um, approach and opportunity to, to our songwriters that are signed. Um, so a recent example would be um, Alex Robson, who I mentioned in a couple of slides ago, she phoned me up and said she wanted to get some more co-writing sessions in her books. So um, I reached out to a company, a management company in the Netherlands, um, who I knew were writing some really, who I knew had a roster of writers who were creating some really good pop music, um, said our writer Alex Robson was up for getting in some writing sessions and set Alex up with a, a guy called Brian Provost, whose artist name is Boost. They wrote a song together, so Alex um, and our other writer Cameron were involved in that session, so it was a 33% um, split each. Um, and the resulting track um, called Want You was released on a label called Chill Your Mind. It's done four million streams. It's um, been playlisted by Radio One. It's been playlisted by Capital. Um, it's, uh, they've just re released an official video for it last week. Um, it's getting a radio campaign in the States. So you can see how there's this chain of events which leads to um, the music being commercially exploited, which is what we as a publisher is our ultimate goal. Because when music's sitting there not released or not doing anything then obviously there's not going to be any any income generated so that's why we do a lot on the, the the creative side and we do a lot of pitching and we do a lot of setting up these sessions because it's within our best interest to try and get um you know as much music and as, as high quality of music out there as possible and in, in a bid to see see financial return Uh, yeah, so I'm just going to just close this off um, with a couple of bits on music synchronisation, which I'm sure a lot of you are interested in, um, and I, hopefully I can kind of touch on what this is and how it works and how you can sort of better your chances of getting music picked up for a sync. So sync, by definition, is when music's put to move an image. So whether that's trailers or, or movies or film, uh, but movies or films are the same things, um, or advertising or games or anything like that. So um, that's that's basically what a sync is, and for for um, for the purposes of this slide, I would just like to bring back the the, the thing I, I mentioned earlier about the, the two copyrights within a song. So to have a piece of music cleared to be used for TV ads, the arts, games, or so on, they have to be um, they have to be given permission from each side. So the publishers have to give give their permission, and the master owners have to give their permission for that piece of music to get used. So what does that mean? So, excuse me, a, a little fun, a fun little exercise and, and, and the sort of give you an insight into the role of a, a music supervisor who, who are essentially the gatekeepers to, to, to these spots to get your music used in TV and ads and games. So music supervisors are the people that are hired by the, the clients. So, you know, Volkswagen or it might be Made in Chelsea or whoever else. And they hire these companies who go out and do the song search. So, um, you know, you need to know the master rights owner and you need to know the publishing, uh, who owns the publishing rights. So you can find all this information, um, you know, if, even if you're not a music supervisor. So this is a fun little exercise just to get you used to it. So you can find the representatives for publishing and masters on popular songs. So I've just used one of our songs just because, um, you know, I can. Um, so using the PRS database, which um, if you are a member, you'll have access to, you can use the search works function to find out the songwriters and their publishers. So I've searched the song Casual um, by the writer Emma White, who's signed to us for this specific track. And you can see on the slide here that um, Notting Hill Music, uh, are, who, are our sub who are our partners, they represent this song. So you'd contact Notting Hill Music if you wanted to clear the publishing on this song. So who would you contact if you wanted to clear the master rates on that? Well, you can find all that information out now on Spotify. 
So Spotify, um, a few years ago, added this song credits function. So if you go to show credits, you'll be able to find information like who performed the track, who wrote the track, who produced the track, and who the master rights owner are, and that's under source. So you can see for this specific track, the master rights owner is Gemstone Records. So if I wanted to, if I wanted to clear this piece of music for a sync, I would have to reach out to Notting Hill Music to clear the publishing, and I'd have to reach out to Gemstone Records to clear the masters. So if you're interested in, in the world of sync and you're interested in sort of getting your music used in sync, then it's really important to know how to present your music to music supervisors or if you're going to straight to production companies, to production companies. Um, at 23rd Precinct Music, we use a platform called Disco. So Disco is a um, music supervision platform which was created by music supervisors for music supervisors. It's essentially a metadata uh, platform which where you can store your music. So um, the, and the importance of metadata and sync cannot be emphasized enough. You really need to have all the key information there, including ISRC, including the year of release, including contact details should um, a music supervisor want to contact you to license the track, to clear the track. Um, things like lyrics are really important as well. Um, you know, if you're looking, if a client, if a music supervisor sent me a brief saying, I'm looking for something that's got the word, um, you know, rainy day or something like that into it, I can search our database in rainy day. And if I've inputted all the lyrics, which I should have done, that'll come to the top of the, the pile. So having things like lyrics are really, really important. Having clean versions, I would say if anybody's out there writing some non-PC music, having clean versions of your tracks is really important, radio friendly. Um, I think as well as uh, it's important as well to have instrumental versions of your tracks. If a track's going to go to edit, then it's important that they have the instrumental version so that they can edit it appropriately. Um, and finally, um, you should check, you should always input the, the, the writer's information. So that's the bit on the far right there. So you can see that I've put the, the publishing information uh, under the writer's tab. Um, but definitely check out disco.ac if you're interested in sort of um, categorising your music in a nice presentable uh, way, which isn't Dropbox or SoundCloud. You can actually create playlists and pitch them direct from disco. So if I create a playlist on disco, I can, di I can drop it directly into the disco inbox of a music supervisor. And you will find that 90% of music supervisors use this platform. So that's hopefully a little helpful tip for you guys out there if you're interested in sync. Um, and just one last thing on sync, just because it's not confusing enough. So uh, here in the UK, there is something known as a blanket license. And um, so a blanket license allows for uh, users to copy from a broad range of repertoire in return for a license fee. So providing convenience and excellent value for money. The license fee is paid to the rights holders whose publications have been shown to be copied. So this is applicable for things like BBC, ITV, Channel 4, Channel 5, Sky. Um, and it basically means that, um, you know, if your bit of music is used in homes under the hammer or something like that, it means that that will just turn up in your publishing statements. They won't have to contact the master rights owner or the publishing rights owner um, to clear that for you. Um, there is just one stipulation that for all tracks to be considered under a blanket license, they must be PRS and PPL registered. So that means that they must be registered from the publishing side and they must be registered from the master side. So PPL, I've not really talked about that much, but if you have a record label, they should be PPL registered. And um, so if you're releasing music on um, whatever label, major, a big indie, whatever, they should be PPL registered. So any, any music that they are distributing, they should be registering the recordings with PPL, which is Phonographic Performance Limited. Um, and PRS, so if you don't have a publisher, then you're responsible for registering your tracks with PRS. But if you do, then obviously your publisher would be responsible for registering your tracks. But that's just something really, really important to note. So I always get people <laughs> saying like, my music would be great for Love Island or my music would be great for, uh, you know, Celebs Go Dating or any of these programmes. So um, it's really important to, to let them know and to let you guys know as well that for that to be uh, even an option, the tracks must be PRS and PPL registered. Okay, yeah, so I think, um, yeah, I just wanted to touch on just quickly some current challenges in music publishing. Um, you know, hopefully, 
I've given you a little bit of a basic understanding of what music publishing is and what that entails. Um, but I think there's more that needs to be done to really um, give artists and songwriters and all those at grassroots level and even intermediate levels the understanding that they need to have of publishing. Um, another challenge is the remuneration can seem unfair in comparison to the time given to the work. So yeah, remuneration and getting paid for your for your work is is um, a difficult thing to balance sometimes when you when you compare the amount of time that you put into creating a composition and what you realistically get out at the end, you know, and I think that you can be a successful songwriter, you totally can be a successful songwriter and you can reap a lot of financial return, but as long as you know your rights, you're looking after your intellectual property and you're managing the exploitation of that intellectual property. Um, the digital revolution obviously has made music <laughs> accessible for us all, which is fantastic, uh, but essentially we've got the world songbook, um, you know, at the click of two fingers, which has really been detrimental to artists and songwriters and just musicians in general getting paid. So, you know, maybe maybe we will see something um, changing in the future, which is going to level up that playing field. There is a really nice, um, really good campaign on at the moment called Broken Record, which you can check online, just hashtag Broken Record. And it's a challenge in the financial viability of um, digital streaming platforms, essentially. Um, another challenge is um, it can take a long time for songwriters to receive income. So um, that is one of the things that we try and manage um, at 23rd Precinct Music is, is ex expectations of when you'll get paid. So um, it's not like if you do a live performance and um, you know you get your fee afterwards or whatever else, you have to wait sometimes years for income to come through, specifically if it's overseas income. Um, you know, you think about how complex the communication network is between your collection societies and um, all the different DSPs that are paying out different royalty rates and everything like that. So you can see it's hugely complex and that in turn has a, an adverse effect on when writers get paid. Um, which is which is a challenge. Um, another one, another challenge, which I think is um, sort of been uh, magnified by the pandemic, really is is the overall uh, reliance on the life sector that we have as a music industry, and you know I think that includes publishing as well. You know we we you get public performance royalties when your music is performed in a live setting, so that could be performing live at the biggest festival in, in the UK or the world, or it could be you performing live at your local pub or your local restaurant. You know, it's really the disparity, and it's, it's, it's going to affect everybody. So I think that is a challenge, and I'm I'm hoping that you know when things do get back to normal, there's going to be a bit more of a level playing field and a bit more of a balanced approach. But um, we'll wait and see. So I just wanted to end on, on opportunities. I don't want to end on a, neg a negative note, obviously. So opportunities in music publishing, as the music industry has developed, there's even more areas for songwriters to explore than ever before. Um, you know, thinking back to an example that we had recently, we, we pitched a song for an in-app game um, for a sync, you know, so there's always these like little snippets of technological advances and um, even things like um, working remotely and songwriting camps remotely and, um, all these little snippets of opportunities which weren't always available, I think that's a great opportunity for, for people who are maybe, maybe live in an island or maybe don't have access to uh, funds to go down to London every weekend or whatever else. So, you know, that's a bit more of a balanced um, approach, I think. And I, I think that's a positive for sure. Um, the pandemic, again, I think has taught us a, a, a big lesson in that the world's a big place and the opportunity to collaborate can definitely start from home. Um, and, you know, we've learned that all from working from home the past year, pretty much, and um, the majority of us. Um, um, you can have a reward and career as a songwriter, composer, producer, if you know your rights, manage them well and seek out opportunities for development. And finally, the world will always need songs. You know, I think um, of all the things that have happened in history and music has prevailed through it all and we're always listening to music in your life but you'll be hard pressed to find someone that doesn't listen to music or enjoy listening to some music so um so yeah i wanted to end on that sort of positive note um and yeah just say thank you so much to you guys for for listening and if you've got any questions then please do drop us an email at info at 23rdprecinctmusic.com 
and um, I'll do my best to respond. Um, but yeah, it's been great chatting to you all and I hope you've enjoyed this session um, music publishing the basics. Thank you. <laughs>